Thank you very much for the invitation and for the privilege to deliver the first lecture after the introductory lecture. And I will speak, as you can see, in English. But sometimes, especially when there are some, some more subtle comments are needed, I perhaps will switch to Polish. I don't know yet. Uh, the idea behind this lecture is to apply category theory to uh, mathematically describe the singularities in general relativity, especially the initial singularity, which is a geometric counterpart of the famous Big Bang. From the very early period of relativistic cosmology, when the expanding universe was discovered, there originated the problem how to describe the initial singularity. This, uh, well, in quote, point out of which uh, evolution of the universe started. Uh, first, the need to describe mathematically this uh, initial singularity uh, originated from the fact that people wanted to avoid initial singularity. And wanting to avoid something, we must know what do we want to avoid. And then, very soon, it appeared, after, especially after the theorems of Hawking and Penrose, that uh, initial singularity cannot be so easily um, avoid it, then uh, we want to mathematically know the nature of this singularity. Uh, I say mathematically because it is a mathematical object. Uh, I will not go into physical interpretation of, of initial singularity, which is a completely different problem. Uh, in, in other words, I will... Today we believe that um, to cope with the initial singularity, we must invest some quantum gravity theory. And uh, I will leave the problem aside and I will consider singularities purely as classical objects. So I don't take into account uh, quantum effects. Why um, initial singularity is so interesting from the mathematical point of view? Uh, it's a, really a, a tricky mathematical problem. Uh, in relativistic cosmology, the difficulty of providing a mathematical definition of the initial singularity uh, stems from the fact that the history of the universe, strangely enough, is not an invariant concept. Because time is relative, so history is a span of time. Uh, if we have quite well um, determined the age of the universe. This is because the simplest cosmological models, friedman lemaitre cosmological models, have some very strong um, symmetries which make one reference frame privileged. And we usually count this, the age of the universe in this privileged reference frame, the so-called Komovic reference frame. But in general, history in relativistic physics is not invariant concept. How to cope with that? It took quite a time to realize that in attempting to solve this problem, we should make use of the fact that the histories of massive particles and photons, that is to say curves in space-times, are invariant. So we use the notion of the history of a particle uh, or a photon just to, well, to describe what happens uh, at the boundary of space-time, uh, uh, at the singularity. What does it mean uh, that space-time is a singular space-time? It also took a quite a time um, to formulate uh, this sort of definition. Space-time is said to be um, singular uh, if there is some positive obstacle that prevents an incomplete curve continuing. This incomplete curve is a history of photon of a, or, or of a particle, that is to say, time-like or null uh, uh, curve, 
And if such a curve cannot be prolonged, uh, it, it, it meets some obstacle in, pro, in attempts to prolong it. That it means that it hit a singularity. But you must be very cautious about the word prolonged, because length is also a relative concept. So the prolongation should be understood in a different way. For instance, if we are dealing with a geodesic, the pro to prolong geodesic means uh, to consider its affine parameters and look whether it could assume as large values as we want. <laughs> Roughly speaking, there are two kinds of such obstacles. Some magnitudes, such as curvature or some scars constructed out of the curvature, become unbounded along a time like before a time like curve ends. This is one of the obstacles. And another sort of obstacle is the pathological behavior of the differential structure of space-time that prevents a time-like curve from being prolonged. And in this talk I will um, focus on the second kind of obstacles, uh, which uh, is the origin of real difficulties for, for relativists. Usually, to cope with the problem, problem we define the completion of space-time. Uh, M is a space-time, that is to say, four-dimensional um, differential manifold. Uh, the dimensionality is for physicists four is important, but we can uh, consider from a mathematical point of view some other uh, n-dimensional manifold. Uh, and we define the completion of M the M bar, which is space-time manifold, and we attach to it um, what is called boundary. And boundary contains singularities. And this is, uh, I will call this a singular boundary. So this is the manifold and this is a singular boundary. Usually in popular pr presentations people say that initial singularity is a point out of which everything started. It is not a point, because point is a concept which is meaningful only in, within the manifold. And we, if we leave manifold, we go to some kind of boundary. And to define this boundary, it's a quite a difficult task. There are many uh, such constructions, uh, and no, none of them is uh, really satisfactory. Uh, the standard geometric tools uh, on space-time manifold do not allow us to cross the boundary, to go from M to delta M. However, the so-called synthetic differential geometry, which is, is a categorical version of the standard differential geometry, and it is based on intuitionistic logic, and um, synthetic differential geometry provides such tools to go to the boundary. And this is exactly the goal of my talk. Um, it will be only a sketch of the idea because it's on the, at the early stage of its uh, development. Uh, in the synthetic di differential geometry, the so-called infinitesimals appear. And uh, they allow us to penetrate very small uh, portions of the manifolds. I call them gems of manifolds, which are not uh, visible for the standard, standard uh, geometric procedures. And uh, if we use uh, machinery of the synthetic differential geometry, uh, then we can penetrate such as very, very infinitesimal parts of space-time. And then we, w when the universe collapses to the singularity, it attains very small parts, uh, very small distances, and then perhaps uh, infinitesimals could be helpful. Uh, we will present a simple model uh, showing what happens beyond the boundary. Strictly speaking, what happens if we leave M, the manifold, and go to the boundary. Um, the model is purely mathematical and uh, mathematically I hope it's rigorous but uh, at the present 
stage of its development, it does not pretend to refer to physical universe. The physical interpretation is another problem. The plan of the talk is uh, very simple. Uh, after these introductory remarks, I will uh, give uh, some necessary definitions of concepts which will be used for mass uh, fundamental concepts of uh, uh, synthetic differential geometry. Then uh, the concept of the manifold in the smallest, the, the description of the differential manifold when the infinitesimals are taken into the count, account. And then I will present our model of the expanding uh, universe or collapsing universe, it's well, the, the direction of time we can manipulate with it. Uh, so the, the central part of the, of the talk is presentation of, of our model and then some comments and in the appendix if there will be time but I don't think we will have more time for enough time for it in, in appendix there are some technical uh, details of our model so preliminaries in synthetic differential geometry one considers various kinds of infinitesimals later on I will show how, how they appear in the model. Uh, let us denote by R uh, the real line uh, R, R fat R, enriched by infinitesimals. So if I write uh, this way it contains infinitesimals and this is traditional uh, real line without in infinitesimals. In the present study we focus on the following uh, infinitesimals. There are various kinds of infinitesimals but only uh, the following will be used uh, in this talk. So uh, this so-called nilpotent infinitesimal, <coughs> we take x uh, and uh, x is so small that its square is zero, but it's a, a, it, x need not be zero. So this is only, uh, uh, this is possible only if we uh, adopt the intuitionistic logic which is presupposed by synthetic differential geometry. We can generalize uh, this uh, infinitesimal. Uh, we can assume that this two could be replaced by another uh, number, uh, one, two, three, if necessary. And we call this infinitesimals, K infinitesimals for short. The, we can generalize this uh, infinitesimal by um, replacing x with a vector uh, x1, xn. Uh, and all um, these expressions are equal zero uh, in this way. Uh, another generalization is, we, is if we take arbitrary k and arbitrary n and then this is, uh, well, we will call this infinitesimal of kth order. And finally, we can also form something like that. Analogously, we define infinitesimals when, we, when r n is replaced by any finite dimensional vector space. Uh, this is uh, just to help our imagination. We may imagine that infinitesimals constitute uh, the entire wo world inside every single point of R. So we can imagine that infinitesimals live inside the point. In other words, uh, that they, for us, they form sort, sort of fiber over X. So if we have a real line like that, so uh, the infinitesimals could be pictured as, as fibers over, over points, usual points. Uh, I cannot go into the details, but this is a very well known fact that owing to the existence of infinitesimals, differentiation becomes a purely algebraic operation and every function is differentiable as many times as required. So if we assume the existence of infinitesimals, the problem with prolongation of space-time is quite easy. Not that tricky like, like, uh, like it is in the standard differential geometry. 
And this creates a uh, unique opportunity for facing the problem of space-time prolongations and singularities in general uh, relativity. And now I have a few tools which will be necessary for us. In what follows, our important tool is the kth order neighboring relation defi defined in this way. We take two vectors of the finite dimensional vector space and they are k-related if this difference between them belongs to these infinitesimals of the kth order. Uh, please look, uh, contemplate for a while uh, this relation because uh, we will operate with it uh, quite often. So we take two vectors and they are so close that the difference between them is infinitesimal of kth order. This uh, relation is reflexive, evidently, and symmetric, but it is not transitive. Instead of transitivity, we have the following formula. U is related to V and V to W. And this implies that U is implied to W, but not uh, as uh, in order K, but in the order K plus L. L is here. Uh, so we have uh, quasi-transitivity. Well, as I said, we must assume that uh, our logic is, in, is um, intuitionistic. So we must assume that everything uh, happens in a suitable category in, in which uh, logic is intuitionistic. I will call this category E, capital. Mm, uh, suitable means uh, that category is equipped among others with a commutative ring object R with infinitesimals and usually it is a topos. Uh, perhaps at the end I will say something about uh, various categories which satisfy these requirements but for the majority of our talk it's not necessary. Let's just assume that everything happens in a suitable category. Let M be n-dimensional manifold in a moment I will define formal manifold, regarded as an object of the category E. Sorry. So M is an object of E, and we are interested in the smallest neighborhoods of M. And a good tool to investigate such neighborhoods is the neighborhood relation, this relation. But first it should be generalized to the manifold concept, and it is very simple. Let we take two points of this manifold and um, non-negative uh, k number and the re this relation holds between these two poles if there exists a coordinate chart f from u open to m this is a coordinate chart, a map uh, and um, if we have that f of, f of x is related to f of y in this, in this way. We simply will write like that if k is 1. So uh, the application of this neighborhood relation to manifolds is quite obvious. Let m be a manifold. We consider three points x, y, z of m and the neighboring relation satisfy the following conditions. Uh, reflexivity if k is equal to 0 and this happens if and only if x coincides with y. Um, x related with y impli implies y related with x, l related, here k related, provided that k is smaller or equal to l. This is a kind of symmetry and we have this um, property x k related with y and y l related with z implies x k, k plus l related with z. This is a quasi triangular triangle formula. Since, since these conditions are very similar to the usual concept of distance, we can define a quasi distance function in the following way. The quasi-distance between x and y is less 
or equal to chi if this relation is satisfied. This is a very specific distance because it is not uh, distance in, in space, say, but it is a distance in the properties of differentiability. But nevertheless it is interesting. Since uh, infinitesimals of k um, order are contained in the difference in, in infinitesimals of L order provided that k is smaller or equal to 1, then in, because of that the, this function, the distance function, determines a size of an object. This size is smaller and this is a bigger size. Of course size should be understood in a, I, I, correctly. Uh, let us also notice that this quasi-metric is quantized because uh, it assumes values in n. Uh, now a few other concepts which are important. The concept of monad. But I warn you that there are two concepts of monads in category theory and in the differential, uh, synthetic differential geometry it's this concept is used. Uh, let x belongs to the manifold, sorry. Uh, the k monad around x is defined in the natural way, this monad of k order. It's a set of y's related to x in this way. So this is infinitely close in the sense of this metric, quasi-metric to, to x. As I said, if, if uh, k is 1, we simply write like that. Uh, we also assume that m infinity makes sense. And obviously we have that if y belongs to the monad then, uh, around x, then x belongs to the monad around y. And if uh, f is a map between manifolds, then this is preserved. This relation is preserved by, by f, by this mapping. Another concept related to the previous one, the kth neighborhood of the diagonal, uh, de defined like this, there are a pair of points related, k related between each other. Um, if V is a n-dimensional vector space, there is a canonical isomorphism between this neighborhood of the diagonal uh, is equal uh, isomorphic to this and this isomorphism is given uh, by this simple uh, formula. We take x and then the difference which belongs to, to here. Consequently, uh, there is an isomorphism between the monad and a uh, set of kth order infinitesimals. Let's also notice that the quasi-metric introduces a partial order in uh, m infinity, mo monad infinity. So the monads are included uh, one in the other. And now another, the last concept which I will introduce before um, showing our model, uh, the manifold in the smallest. The existence of infinitesimals essentially enriches the structure of differential manifolds and it enables the following definition. An object M in the category E is said to be a K-formal n-dimensional manifold if for each point X of M there exists a monad around X which is isomorphic to uh, infinitesimals of the order K and um, also the map, uh, this map. So, so monad acts here as a domain of the local chart. And there is a bijective map from the set of infinitesimals of order k to the monad. Uh, and this map uh, is isomorphism, as we know. It x to the zero uh, in, in the monad, then this map is called a frame, k frame at x k can assume infinite values. 
Uh, if uh, k is infinity, we speak of formal n-dimensional manifold without specifying k. And uh, I would like to stress that the dimension go, goes through, through this. And uh, this set of infinitesimals is assumed to be uh, isomorphic to the monad. And so we, we should see, think about uh, formal manifold as usual manifold, but, uh, but the, with the proviso that uh, charts of local uh, maps, uh, domains of local charts uh, are monads. It can be easily seen that Rn for every n is a formal n-dimensional manifold. Uh, okay, if m and n are formal manifolds, then the product is a formal manifold. And if m is a formal n-dimensional manifold, the tangent bundle, which in differential geometry is simply a set of functions from d to m, is a two and dimensional formal manifold. Okay, so these are concepts which are used now uh, in sketching our model, which uh, is almost obvious from when we have in mind uh, all these definitions. So let's consider a singular space-time. It is singular in the sense previously explained that it contains at least one incomplete curve that cannot be continued in any extension of the space-time. This is a standard definition uh, of uh, singular space-time in general relativity. The regular part of the space-time forms a differential manifold. And we make a completion of this space-time. So we complete M, we attach a, a singular boundary, this is uh, M bar is a completion of the manifold, and we call uh, delta M the singular boundary of M, uh, and we assume that this boundary is attainable from M, that is to say M is open and dense in M bar. Details of this construction are not important uh, in this talk. Uh, they deserve, have deserved a lot of literature the various constructions of uh, singular boundaries are known, such as uh, G boundary, geodesic boundary, B boundary, causal boundary, and many, many others. But in, in this talk, uh, it's not necessary because I will describe this boundary directly from the synthetic differential geometry. Uh, just a caution, a singular boundary can contain, besides endpoints of inextendable curves, also some other curves. For instance, if we have a universe collapsing to, to the Bing crunch, to the final singularity, then all geodesics terminate, all curves terminate at the singularity. But if you have a singularity inside the black hole, some curves terminate and some avoid the, 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 space, uh, the, the singularity. Um, space-time can also contain some points at infinity, which also, strictly speaking, do not belong to the manifold. In what follows, we assume for simplicity that the boundary contains only endpoints of inextendable curves that cannot be continued in any extension of space-time. For the sake of concreteness, uh, let us think about Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker uh, space-time with the Big Bang at the singularity, that is to say the standard cosmological model which is described in many cosmological um, publications. And the, at the beginning of the world's evolution we have a Big Bang. Uh, your geometric counterpart of the Big Bang is a singular the singularity and this is a so-called strong curvature singularity. The singularities, various kinds of singularities are classified uh, and the strongest one are strong curvature singularities also, and this is exactly uh, what happens in the Big Bang in cosmology. Mm, and uh, we will contemplate the evolution of the universe backwards in time from the present state to the singularity. So everything happens according to the standard cosmological model. The universe shrinks 
subsequent cosmic eras succeed, succeed each other. Finally, the contraction attains the state in which differential properties of space-time um, start to break and then break com completely. Uh, <coughs> the universe leaves the manifold region M and enters its boundary. This means that the standard smooth manifold description breaks down and we assume that at this stage the category E takes over. This is a tricky point and in the appendix I try to explain, to describe more in a more detailed way how this process of changing from the differential manifold to the category H could look like, but now I must jump over that. The contraction, so we, we, we have left uh, the manifold uh, region and we enter the boundary, but contraction goes on. Uh, the uh, infinitesimals enter into the play and thus the uh, methods of synthetic di differential geometry uh, now could be applied. Uh, a general picture that emerges, emerges is the following. After crossing the boundary, domains U of local charts, open uh, subsets of U, uh, domains of local charts uh, of the manifold, become infinitesimal. And the manifold becomes four-dimensional formal manifolds, and local charts are now of the form monads, uh, well, are, are, are domains of the local charts. In, in nom, uh, sorry, sorry. Mm. K is equal at the beginning of this process infinity. So we have still the good differentiability properties. But the universe continues shrinking and finally its size reduces to a single monad. So, so to a single chart. chart. And uh, the universe is described by the single monad. Uh, but contraction goes on. But now we, we can imagine that everything what I am speaking now about is happening inside a point x1, x0, this point. So um, everything, um, so, so, so contraction, we, have, we are in a single point x0, but contraction goes on, but only in the sense of the metric distance equal or less to k, this quasi-distance. So it is not a spatial distance, but properties of differentiability d d determine the, the sort of, dis of distance. And uh, k becomes smaller and smaller. This means that the differentiability properties are lower and lower, and we obtain a decreasing sequence of monads. When we have crossed the boundary, it was bon monad infinity, then k, k minus 1, minus 2, and so on, and so on. So the universe is shrinking inside the, the singular point, but nevertheless, uh, owing to the subtle um, geometric, geometric tools, we, are, um, we have some insight into it. Finally, when the contraction produces M monad uh, with the k equal zero, the process stops since M zero, monad zero, is simply uh, when, when these when this points x and other points are zero related, which means that x zero equals to, to y, and all quasi-distances reduces to zero, and we have nothingness <laughs> in this sense. So in th this is the, the, the last stage of, of the contraction. Uh, as a comment, we can just to reverse the process and start to look at the same process beginning from, from the initial singularity and look uh, in, into the future. It seems natural to regard increasing sequence of case 
uh, as a sort of quantized time, but it's a very special time. Uh, of course, we can, if you don't like this idea, you can consider this only the K just, just to be a parameter, but I think uh, it gives some, uh, some idea uh, to our mind. The time at the beginning as a property of, uh, of differentiability is something perhaps interesting. However, it is important to notice that K, in fact, means the degree of differentiability. That is to say, the place at which the Taylor expansion trun truncates, all higher orders are van uh, vanishing. Each subsequent instance of, ta of this time improves differential properties in this process. It is astonishing that the transition from K equals zero to K equal one is so extremely rich, having at our disposal the very first degree of differentiability, that is to say k equal to 1, we can do large parts of affine geometry, affine connection included, combinatorial differential forms, tang tang tangent bundle, and a lot of differential geometry. There is a um, fundamental textbook by Koch, in fact, two fundamental textbooks by Koch uh, on synthetic differential geometry. And this book uh, is limited, in fact, to explore the geometry of the first order neighborhood. So it is strange that from zero to one, we have so, so rich mathematics already. Of course, when we jump to k equal 2, different, differential geometric properties substantially improve. Some aspects of metric geometry, ordinary metric, can uh, be uh, already defined. Uh, for, for doing k-jet theory, we evidently need a sufficiently high k. Uh, and this map, and this, if this map maps finally when k equals goes to infinity, we end up with this monad, infinity monad, and we have the full differentiability. As the universe expands, it goes through the phase of a formal manifold, and when infinitesimal ceases to play any role because of the expansion, uh, the standard smooth manifold regime takes over. In the language of space-time boundary, this means that the universe goes from the boundary to uh, space, at ordinary space-time. And it is here that we should place the transition from the category theory E to the category set uh, and possibly identify this transition with what physicists call the Planck uh, threshold. I think my time goes to the end, so I uh, I will, I, uh, I attained the boundary of my talk, uh, so I s leave the appendix, well, when the proceedings are published or somebody is interesting, I can uh, provide the text of, this, of, of these talks. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Of course, uh, we can say a, a lot of uh, words about uh, what else can be done with this. Thank you.